introduce you to Representative Heather Wilson of New Mexico, Republican. She returns to our table this morning. Our focus is going to be on uh, her concerns about the FISA law and its, uh, it is, its capabilities for the kinds of terrorism that the nation faces in the 21st century. Thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. I, I want to uh, uh, use this as a bit of a backdrop for the conversation. Uh, this is the Philadelphia newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, with more details of alleged Fort Dix plot is the headline here, and talking about uh, the, the emerging information that they're receiving about this group of people uh, in, in the United States who had planned to uh, use um, weapons, including homemade bombs, nitroglycerin, and other explosives, uh, which they did in a training session in the Poconos during the February and tried to recruit others to join them uh, in what a federal prosecutor yesterday called a radical Islamic theology. It's stories like this that have Congress debating what the right approach is. Mm -hmm. You spoke out on the floor very recently about your concerns about the FISA law. Tell us what you had to say. Well, the law was written in 1978 when most local calls were over wires and long distance calls or long haul calls were over the air. The law makes a difference between, um, there's, there's no warrant required to collect things that are going over the air. You have to kind of minimize American involvement and don't, you know, you don't, we don't spy on Americans, but, but they're just over the air. Now we have the complete reverse in technology. Most local calls go over the air. It's 230 million Americans have cell phones, but long haul calls are mostly over wires. The foreign intelligence we need to connect, collect generally are long haul calls. And so we've got this reverse situation where the law puts a lot of protection where we now don't, uh, we don't need it. And it doesn't provide protection to Americans who are using cell phones all over the world. And how is the debate over this proceeding through the Congress? It is not, unfortunately. Um, there has been very little movement at all in the Intelligence Committee on, on which I serve. In fact, none at all. I offered an amendment to modernize the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And the thing that really told me we've got to act now is that the Director of National Intelligence came up to the Senate last week and said, we are not getting very important information. Um, and when, when the head of our intelligence agency says we're missing stuff that may be important, uh, that should set off alarm bells with everyone. Let me give the phone numbers uh, to the audience. If you'd like to join in this conversation, uh, you're most welcome. 202-737-0002 for Democrats watching us, our line for Republicans, 202-737-0001, and our independent line at C-SPAN, 202-628-0205. In real practicality, how does the FISA program exist with the wireless warrant uh, uh, wire, warrantless wiretapping, excuse me, uh, well, debate that we had in this country about a year ago. Until December of 2005, the full Intelligence Committee had not been briefed on the President's terrorist surveillance program. Only eight members of Congress had. It was very, very limited. I was the one who demanded, uh, initially by letter to the Justice Department, and then when I was rebuffed, publicly demanded to be briefed. I was the chair at that time of the committee that oversees the National Security Agency. We were. Uh, one of the things that's changed, in January the Attorney General sent a letter to the Congress saying they're bringing this program under, under the supervision of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. I have to say I have read those court orders, I've read the memorandums of law, and we are still stretching a single size sheet to cover a king size bed. Um, and and uh, we need to update this law. Explain what you mean by the, the fact that it's being stretched. What are your concerns? It is hard to explain because the, the, the matters are classified and I have to continue to protect uh, American national security. But they've got a, a, they had a single judge in a secret proceeding that's non-adversarial that signed off on some court orders which the Attorney General has publicly described as innovative. Um, wouldn't be the first time that someone legislated from the bench. And I think that the best thing pr to protect American civil liberties and make sure that we're collecting intelligence information we need to keep us safe is for Congress to modernize this law. We know that it's not working, and yet the, the Democrat majority is refusing to act. This town has been buzzing for the past two days about the testimony of the former Justice Official James Comey yes. about the administration's desire for continuation of the warrantless program. What did you, what can you put your interpretation on what you heard from him? Jim Comey is a very credible guy. When we had known before that there was a visit to, to John Ashcroft, uh, we didn't know in, in the, the rich detail that Jim Comey te testified to earlier this week. Uh, I also want to get you on the record before calls because it connects to the Attorney General, his testimony, and his own political fate. 
Uh, some Republicans on the Senate side are beginning to suggest that the Attorney General is no longer uh, an effective leader in the department. What's your own position based on all the testimony we've heard from him over the past weeks? I've never called for the resignation of a president's cabinet member, Democrat or Republican, and I think that those things, the president decides his own staff and I decide mine, and, uh, and that's up to him and the attorney general with the confirmation of the Senate. Well, all those political savvy C-SPAN callers out there are connecting all the dots on this, as you know, so I'd like to have you answer the question before it comes from the callers about your own involvement in the telephone calls uh, on, with uh, David Iglesias and where that whole investigation stands. Uh, uh, my call to David was entirely appropriate, and and I think that that I put out an extensive statement about this at the time, and there's absolutely nothing that's changed. Okay, let me get to some calls then for you. Heather Wilson of New Mexico. Uh, first telephone call is from Fairfax, Virginia, on the Democrats line. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Fairfax. Yes, you're on. Uh, yes, um, I just wanted to uh, have uh, Miss Wilson comment on two things. The first one is is uh, the the visit to the hospital that you were you were speaking of. Now here we have a situation where John Ashcroft, I don't think anybody can call him liberal, was not was not willing to sign up on this thing. He had very big and not to mention Mr. Comey had big questions about it. So if it's so if it's such a cut and dry thing and we have to have it, then why are these people not willing to sign up on it? And I, I think it just goes to a, 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 a a, a sort of a, a corruption, not corruption, but a kind of mentality that, that you know, you guys can do whatever you want and, 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 you know, the Justice Department and so forth be damned. The second thing I want her to comment about is uh, that was a very uh, nonchalant way of, of putting off this issue with David Iglesias. Can you explain to us, please, why you felt it necessary to call him in the middle of your re-election campaign to tell him to investigate voter fraud. Thank you very much. With respect to the visit to the hospital and the weakness of the legal case, I, when, when this whole thing became public and the Attorney General testified on the legal justification for the program, um, I thought that the legal justification was very weak, which is why I called for the, the intelligence committees to be fully briefed. The, the law requires that, that the intelligence committees be fully informed about uh, ongoing programs. And, uh, and I felt that the, the justification for doing the terrorist program, terrorist surveillance program, was very weak. I also believe that, it's, that the information we're getting from it is very important. And I've sat down with the analysts who are doing this. I've looked at their procedures. I haven't found any excesses, um, although I haven't, certainly haven't gone through every file. But it, it, um, uh, it, to me, it was a mistake for the administration not to come to the Congress shortly after 9-11 and say, look, I've initiated this program because we need to do it now, but we really do need to update this law or authorize this program. And frankly, we oversee highly classified programs all the time uh, that, that, um, uh, that uh, that are as sensitive as this one, in some cases more so. So the idea that somehow, you know, you couldn't tell the House and Senate Intelligence Committees just doesn't wash with me. Before you leave that topic for his second question, uh, could you talk more specifically about the ways that you see that the law can be strengthened to address the concerns that you have? I think one of the most important things is that we need to make it technology neutral. By that I mean we want to protect people who are Americans or people who, people who are protected by the Constitution, people who are in this country. That's the intention of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. So make it technology neutral, um, make it focus on protecting the rights of Americans, uh, and, uh, and so update it that way from a technological point of view. I also think that there need to be checks and balances very clearly in the law between the three branches of government. And right now, one of my concerns is that I don't think we're getting complete information under these new sets of court orders from the administration. Uh, and by informing different branches of government, you create that tension and those checks and balances among the three branches of government. Question two is on the Iglesias call. Yeah, my call to David was entirely appropriate. And I've, I've uh, released a statement that's pretty comprehensive on this. And I, when I have a constituent who who has knowledge of ongoing investigations, who calls me and says we have a U.S. attorney who's intentionally delaying corruption prosecutions, then I have to, I have to act. That was a deeply troubling allegation to me. 
and I dealt with it by calling David directly. He denied it, and I accepted him as a, at his word. After the Comey testimony, there's uh, been a, a response from the Justice Department. It's in the Washington Post today. The Justice Department said yesterday it will not retract a sworn statement in 2006 by Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez that the terrorist surveillance program had aroused no controversy inside the Bush administration, despite congressional testimony Tuesday that senior official, department officials had nearly resigned in 2004 to protest such a program. And I, they then go on to quote exactly what he said and so on. And I'm less interested in parsing those kinds of words than I am looking at the program and what's important for American national security. I always assume that any proposal, uh, any policy proposal, particularly one that is, uh, uh, that is as serious as this one, will engender a tremendous discussion in any bureaucracy. So, so I always assume controversy in this town. C. Ford, Delaware, Republican line. Good morning. Good morning, Susan. Good morning, Congress lady. Uh, is there, do we have the opportunity to call your office? Call your office and get a statement, a written statement, what you've sworn to or what you committed to on this conversation. I think it's actually uh, probably on my website, but sure, you can. I've, I've written to many constituents about it. I don't think you're a New Mexican. Uh, but any New Mexican that writes to me gets an answer well, in writing signed there. by we me. We spend yes. money there, and I am an American citizen. I am paying your, your you know, your salary. Yes, sir. I understand. And, but, are you uh, willing to go under oath? Are you, if, if they were to call you before the committee, would you go under oath? Oh, I, under oath, I absolutely stand a hundred percent behind what I've said. And and I'll tell you this: I'm an Air Force Academy graduate. I took an oath to an honor code a long time ago, and that's the way I live my life. If I sign a letter or a statement or make a public statement, I stand by it 100% whether I have my hand on the Bible or not. Uh, your website address? It is www.house.gov uh, www backslash Wilson. And we have a, a, it on the screen right now. And if you are interested, it's easy to find the statement as you navigate the website. I think it is. If it's not on there, just call the office and we'll mail you the letter and I will sign it to you, sir. Bowie, Maryland, Independent Line. Good morning. Hello. You're on. Uh, good morning, ladies. Uh, good, morning. good morning, Ms. Wilson. Thank you so much for your uh, service to this country. Um, what I want to say is, is that the, the 15 years that I've been doing what I do, uh, I've dealt directly with FISA, and uh, I applaud your efforts to try and make the program better. You definitely need, uh, like you said, technology neutral. You need to streamline things because yeah. from my own personal experience, uh, the office that I worked in, we would have requests go in that would be waiting for months. Months, I mean, I'm talking eight, nine, ten months a year where things that were hot after 12 months, hey, they're no longer hot. They could actually be gone. So, so whatever you can do to fix the process, uh, please do your best to make it better. And the other thing I wanted to say, you know, I drive the Beltway every day. I listen to C-SPAN. You have a lot of callers that call in worried about uh, you know, their, their rights as Americans and whether they're being monitored or whatever. You have, you have so many just folks like me who grew up, I love this country, I do this job every day, I, I'm out there trying to protect folks. They all get trained on what to do and what not to do as far as protecting Americans. We get that training. I, I, every year we would have an update on that training. And, and before dealing directly with FISA, we would have to go through a two-hour class. So folks need to know that their rights uh, are being protected, and they don't need to worry. But thank you for, for your service, and thanks so much for uh, time to speak. Caller, before you go, since this is an anonymous phone call, can you tell us which agency you work for so that you work so frequently with FISA? Um, well, I previously worked uh, up at Fort Meade, if that, uh, that's good enough for you. Okay, and your, your specific suggestions for reform would be what? Well, the specific suggestion that I have as far as what, what I do is that the process, it's, it's very slow. The, the FISA process, I don't know if it's due to the fact that it was created in 78, but all I can tell you is that the folks in my office that actually would push the requests up, you know, every, all we would ever be told is that it's stuck in legal, it's stuck in legal, it's stuck in legal. And so the requests that we would put in would, would simply be hanging there for months and months and months. And without the, the approval, we can't go forward. And so, you know, if, if you're on a daily basis trying to fight these terrorists uh, and, and these approvals for these requests don't go forward, there's no way legally that we can pursue it. 
And so that just makes uh, it, it not, only, not, only, not only makes the job difficult, it makes it impossible. Thank you for your call. Thank you so much for calling because, because you're absolutely right. It's not only streamlining the process, but you know, we're now, the, the, the FISA law was written largely to be able to spy on, in, during the Cold War on agents who might be in the United States. And the Cold War was much more of a set piece affair. And we now are trying to find, find and fight networks of terrorists who are using 21st century communications against us. And speed and agility is extremely important. So if you pick up somebody in Pakistan who has a scrap of paper in his pocket with six phone numbers, you think he's associated with Al Qaeda. Six of the, or five of those phone numbers are for safe houses, known Al Qaeda safe houses. And the sixth one is in Maryland. How long are we going to wait for the legal stuff to get done to start listening to any phone call coming from overseas into that number in Maryland? That time delay creates risk. And so we want to both streamline that and get, get very clear procedures in place so that you can very rapidly go up on that number and, and follow up with permissions later. There's an emergency provision in the current FISA law. Unfortunately, it requires that the Attorney General himself certify that everything is done except a ju judge signing off. So you have to go through all the legal stuff um, for probable cause for a warrant before uh, you can start listening. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's really hampering our ability to collect intelligence. Miami, you're on the air. Republican line, go ahead. You know, all my Democratic friends tell me how the Patriot Act and the Bush administration is trampling on our civil liberties. But, you know, if I'm talking to, if I'm talking overseas to a suspected terrorist, I would hope that my phone call is being tapped. My real concern is domestic surveillance, and I've been a victim of it. And here's an example. I was, I have people, I have law enforcement looking in my vehicle, and what I mean by that is I got a, a ticket for not wearing a seatbelt. Now, I don't mean to trivialize the issue or make fun of what we're talking about, but, you know, um, the DOT is running radio commercials now with a tone saying, you will be caught. And the state of Florida is running spots telling us to wash our hands and cover our mouths when uh, we cough. You know, I've got people who uh, the Democrats seem to want to extend habeas corpus to people picked off the battlefield, but they're taking our property through eminent domain and restricting our free speech uh, through campaign finance reform. I think we need to get our priorities straight here. Thank you. I I don't have much comment on the Florida law, but I do tell my kids to uh, to cover their mouth when they cough and and wash their hands. So so uh, maybe I, I may be worse than the state of Florida. Next phone calls from Orlando, Florida. This is on our Democrats line. You're on. Orlando, Florida. And caller, please hit the mute button on your TV. There's an echo. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment that I think you know the Attorney General being being. The one that went ahead and, and pushed this for the president, it's just, it's just very disturbing to me. I think the president is um, parading on our constitutional rights with this. And I don't like terrorist surveillance program. Really, it's spying on Americans, in my opinion. And also, uh, just one other quick comment. With regard to uh, Attorney David Iglesias, who leaned on Senator Pete Domenici uh, to call him also. Thank you. Bye. Um. With respect to the, the terror surveillance program, it is, the, the program is designed, and there are a lot of checks in it, and I sat down and looked at all of them, to listen to the phone calls of known terrorist agents or people affiliated with Al-Qaeda calling in to the United States. So it is actually very limited. It does not use, and now comes under some supervision from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, but at least when it was initially set up, it doesn't use the mechanisms anticipated in the FISA law. I, I think that the FISA law needs changing and modernizing because I think we should be listening. If a, if a known al-Qaeda terrorist agent is calling into the United States, we should be all over that call like white on rice. And, and we should be able to do it very quickly, while also putting in very clear guardrails to protect the civil liberties of Americans. If the FISA law were effectively updated, would the warrantless program be needed? No, it would not be needed I, because you would put provisions in there so that you could very rapidly get permission to listen to known terrorist agents calling into the United States. And what do you think the impetus will be for Congress revisiting this? Well, I, I tried to do it last week 
and the amendment was not made in order, I will continue to try to build support for modernizing this law. And the Director of National Intelligence has come up to testify on this um, uh, and has said it, it desperately needs modernizing. Are you getting any support from the Justice Department or the White House in the effort? The, uh, the lead is being taken by the Director of National Intelligence, who is Mike, Mike McConnell, and he is the one who's come up and presented what the changes are that he thinks needs to be made. Baton Rouge, good morning. Yes, good morning. This may be an oversimplification, but I believe that the people that are doing the wiretapping are looking for specific things. I don't think they're really concerned about what congressman or what senator is sleeping or having an affair with this, that, or the other. I think they're specifically looking for terrorists that want to kill Americans. And I personally don't care if someone listens in on all of my phone calls, reads everything on my computer. If you don't have anything to hide, then why kick up such a fuss? I think some of these people that are raising such a fuss have something to hide. Well, uh, uh, the reason that we have the foreign intelligence surveillance law is because that there were excesses by our intelligence agencies and by the FBI in the, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Somebody gave me a declassified memorandum once. It was signed by, by uh, Bobby Kennedy and J. Edgar Hoover, and it was the memorandum authorizing the wiretapping of Martin Luther King. And, of course, some of that information was then subsequently used to try to discredit Mr. King. And I, I, so, so it's those kinds of abuses that, came, that, that led to the FISA law. The, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is intended to be able to listen to conversations specifically to collect foreign intelligence information in the United States. So it is very much focused on, on foreign threats. There are other mechanisms if, to, to be able to listen to conversations for criminal investigations and law enforcement gets wiretaps both under federal and state law for criminal investigations all the time, but there's a different procedure for that. Let me share with you two editorials in national newspapers today that have uh, all come out of Jim Comey's testimony this week on the warrantless wiretapping program. New York Times lead editorial, Mr. Gonzalez's Incredible Adventure, writes this. They ask, did Mr. Bush start by authorizing the agency to intercept domestic emails and telephone calls without first getting a warrant? Mr. Bush has acknowledged authorizing surveillance without a court order of communications between people and abroad in the United States. That alone violates the 1978 Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Domestic spying without a warrant would be an even more grievous offense. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, the, the justification they, that the administration has given for doing this, it does not rely on the FISA law. Uh, what the, the president through the attorney general said when they came up to explain the law after it was revealed publicly is that the president was using his powers under the Constitution, which he argued could not be limited by a statute from Congress. I thought that was a very weak justification in an area where Congress has chosen to legislate and the, and the president has, or previous president, had signed that law and that the administration should have come to the Congress a long time ago to authorize this program. That might be your response to a different view then in the Wall Street Journal this morning, Wiretap Tales, and here's what they write. So where's the smoking gun here? When the program was reauthorized by the president alone, Mr. Comey and others planned to resign in protest. So, Mr. Spector asked, does that mean the program went forward illegally? Again, negative. The, quote, the Justice Department certification was not required as far as I know, unquote. That's because, even, as even Mr. Comey conceded, many judges and scholars believe a president has the constitutional authority to approve such wiretaps, especially in war wartime. And I... Uh, that was their justification, that so that there are inherent powers in the Constitution for the president in wartime to be able to listen to foreign communications. And uh, 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 this was one of those things where, you know, we could argue about the constitutionality of this and it could go all the way up to the Supreme Court and they could make a decision or something, or we as the Congress could say, all right, what is reasonable here? What is the right thing to do? How do we as three branches of government set out the rules of the road here so we can rapidly listen to the terrorists trying to kill us and put guardrails in place to protect American civil liberties. Rather than argue about the constitutional niceties, I tried to focus on what do we need to do, irrespective of the fact that I think that the administration should have come to us a long time ago and both briefed us on the program and re recommended changes to the law. And, and the, the sad thing is that now it becomes much more difficult to make the needed changes. In the wake of 9-11, we passed the, the Patriot Act very quickly. 
Uh, we could have done the same for updating the FISA law, uh, uh, but the, the administration didn't even say it had a problem. Ms. Wilson is a member of the Intelligence Committee, and as she re referenced earlier, she is now the senior Republican on its subcommittee on technical and tactical intelligence. Next telephone call for her is from uh, Long Island, New York. Long Island, you're on. Go ahead. Hello, Mrs. Wilson. Good morning. Yeah, how you doing? Um, you mentioned 9-11 uh, a couple minutes earlier, uh, and I want to ask you about the, the links between intelligence agencies, the ISI, the Pakistani intelligence agency, that why the hijack is $100,000, okay? The Muhammad Atta is an ISI agent. We know this because why the hijack is $100,000, okay? We know that, okay? So my question to you is why haven't we uh, questioned Muhammad, uh, Mahmoud Ahmed, okay, the Pakistani general, the ISI general, why haven't we uh, asked him what is his, uh, you know, involvement in 9-11? What is the Pakistani general involvement in 9-11? We asked them, we want to know what, what is their, you know, what are they doing? What is the problem with them? We want to know why they wired the hijackers $100,000. That the ISI, it's been confirmed by the British press, and it's been confirmed in, in the Indian Times, okay? So let me ask you a question. Why has the Pakistani intelligence agency wired the hijackers $100,000? We know that he's an ISI agent. Okay. Answer that question. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure that we do know that, and and uh, and I'm not sure that I can answer your question. Um, it's not it's not an area of expertise for me, and I'm, and I'm not sure that I can even uh, deal with the the fact pattern you just presented. Do you feel comfortable that all the questions have been answered surrounding 9/11? Well, I, over time there may become more things that we know. I think from, to the to the credit of the 9/11 Commission, they really did do a very good historical piece on how things happened and what happened, um, and what were the, the failures both of intelligence uh, and bureaucratic failures between agencies to, to failure to see certain indicators. These are very committed terrorists and very committed groups, and they're continuing every day to try to kill Americans. I think that's one of the things we get complacent about. You know, we've now gone five and a half years without another terrorist attack in this country. That's not an accident. And we have intelligence agencies in this country who every day people are getting up, going to work, doing the best they can to try to keep people from killing us. They, that, you know, we all remember where we were on 9-11. I'm sure you remember where you were, what you had for breakfast, what you, what you were wearing. Very few Americans remember where they were when the British government arrested 16 people about to walk aboard aircraft and blow them up over the Atlantic. And that was in August of last year because it didn't happen. And I think intelligence is our first line of defense in the war on terror. Next call's from Farmington, New Mexico, Republican line. Good morning. Well, good morning, C-SPAN. This is Smitty from Farmington, New Mexico. Hey, Smitty. Uh, this is an absolutely great show. Uh, Heather, you almost lost it, but we got you in. Yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, when I say it's a great show, right before the election, I talked to both Newt Gingrich and uh, Dick Army, and this is the only place in the world you can do that. Uh, we have to in this country get an idea of what these people are trying to do to us. You just mentioned, I wasn't even why I was calling, but you just mentioned the attackers that were going to blow planes up over the Atlantic. They weren't going to blow them up over the Atlantic. They were going to blow them up over New York City and the cities they were flying into. So all that death and destruction would have been rained on our cities. They would not have only killed all the people on those 10 airplanes, but they would have killed people on the ground, too, a whole lot of them. These people are nuts. Bridget Gabriel just came out with a book that gives a darn good idea of how these people believe and what they're willing to do. They, they ruin the country of Lebanon just so that they can get their uh, uh, Islamic uh, Sharia law uh, and, 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 and the kill them or uh, convert them philosophy into being. They want to do this to the entire world, folks. And if we've got a prisoner that has information we need to save American lives, I, I just heard somebody describe it on the TV the other day. It ought to be just a two-minute conversation. Do they have information we need? Go get it. I don't care what you do to get it. Uh, this is what we need to be doing. Right before you came on, Heather, they, we were talking about uh, uh, illegal immigration. It needs to be stopped. There's a real easy way of doing it. You cut off the jobs. If employers are hiring people, put them in jail for a while, and the rest of them will stop doing it. When they see enough employees 
or employers going to jail, they're going to stop hiring illegals themselves. Newt Gingrich has got some of the best uh, solutions for it. It's the same darn thing I've said. If you want a secure card, get fees for a MasterCard to do it. You let the federal government do it, and they're going to screw it up like they do everything else. Uh, he's got the right idea. That's what needs to be done. Dry up the jobs, and the people will go home. Thank That's you, the way to take care of illegal immigration. Thank you. Call. Thank you. With respect to employers and illegal immigration, one of the biggest challenges for employers is that the fake documents look so much like the real ones. You can't, I, you know, you can't tell a difference. And so one of the things we need to do as part of immigration reform is to get biometric visas. By that, whether it has your thumbprint or an eye scan, so you can tell, yeah, this is the same guy that applied for the visa in El Salvador, or, uh, and, and they're here legally, and I can hire them. And then, if an employer is hiring people illegally, they should be hammered for it. Could you explain a few more of the specifics of, uh, that, you, that are on the record about the domestic uh, wiretapping program? Uh, it's now supervised by the FISA court after the, the uh, controversy of a year or so. But how does it work? I can't describe that, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, is it a broad application, or must people uh, go after certain individual targets? Um, I have described it publicly as a broad application and, uh, uh, and as stretching the law, uh, and I am very concerned about it. I, I, um, uh, I think we need to change the law, and I, I, but I cannot describe it in detail. Okay, so question. maybe you can answer this. The caller that said earlier, I don't care if people read my email. I don't care if people listen to my phone calls. Can most Americans assume that their email no. and phone call traffic is being no. observed? And I do care if somebody reads my email. And, and you know, uh, I don't much care if people find out when I, you know, go to the hairdresser or whatever or what I'm having for lunch or my husband needs to bring home a gallon of milk. I, but people have a right to privacy and an expectation of privacy when they call somebody or are talking to somebody. And the reason that we have these laws is because that was abused in the past. And, and, and so people do have a right to privacy. And this program does focus on international communications with known uh, folks who are trying to kill us. But I am concerned about the way this is being done. Little Rock, good morning. Democrats line. Hey, hello, my name is Freddie. Uh, I got two questions, really. I keep hearing everybody say that this is really stuff. Okay, like, if y'all know who the person is calling, y'all say a terrorist calling from overseas. If you know he's a terrorist and you know what phone he's using and you know who he's calling, why don't you just arrest him? And the second point I want to make is everybody keeps saying trust the government. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trust the government. And, but, like, I'm a Democrat. But every time we elect y'all, when y'all go there, y'all co completely forget what we ask y'all to do. I mean, it's like, like, you make deals like an idiot. I mean, some of the deals you make, like, Fair trade is for, like the guy called about immigration. My, I, I got a job. They take my fingerprint. They can go back and tell the day I was born and everything. So if, you can tell if a person is illegal or not because I had to, I had to use my fingerprint to get a job. Mm -hmm. It tells me what tells me what high school I went to, where I was born, my mother and father and all that. So it's it's not hard to, it's not hard to figure out if a person is here legally or illegally. But the problem is you don't really cur because if you curred, you stop it. And like I said, if y'all would if y'all would uh, uh, that immigration bill. If I give everybody amnesty, the people that did that at Fort Dix, they would have became American citizens. They would have had the right to go into them bases, join the military. Y'all would have put the, the, the fox in the hen house because y'all would have made them American citizens. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, now, I, some days, even for a member of Congress, the system that we've set up is frustrating because you think about, you, you know, there are things that you try to get done, and they may even be simple things, not something as complicated as the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Just simple things. And, and it takes so long even to get a simple thing done. And it's frustrating to us as well as to, to the people who sent us to Washington, even though you're trying to be persistent and work on it. And here, the reality is that our system of government was not set up to be efficient or to change quickly. It was set up dividing power to protect all of us from tyranny. That's the reason we have three different branches of government and a House and a Senate and you know, a president who can veto legislation. That makes it frustrating when you want change, but it also means that no single individual or small group of people can take our precious rights away from us. And so, so that I, I try to justify it to myself that way some days when I'm feeling frustrated because I'm trying to get something done that seems like it shouldn't be that hard. Lake Park, Georgia, Republican line. Yes, good morning. Good morning. 
Um, I'm one of those people who thinks that um, law enforcement has way too much power right now. I think they always overstep their bounds. All the people saying, hey, I don't care if they look at this and I don't care if they read my email. I do. I do. They care. They care. They keep everything a secret. You know, you can't pry any information out of the government in any way, shape, or form. And it, and it really seems like they're not looking for terrorists. They're not looking for anybody from any other country. They're looking to spy on Americans only. Uh, just like your previous caller said, you can find out if somebody's illegal. You can find out easy. Because they got records on Americans all the way back to the day they were born. You know, they could pull the hard copy on my first grade report card if they wanted. Right? Yeah, they can. But these guys coming over from across the border, you don't know what country they come from, why they're here, any story they make up. Okay, that's good enough. Somehow that doesn't really seem like you're protecting us at all. I mean, I know from personal experience, uh, my one call to the labor commissioner the uh, of Georgia, Michael Thurman, a thug that he is, um, you know, complained about their terrible service there. Okay, anytime I walk in there, this is a complaint. There was no threat or anything. There is an armed security that follows me around. Okay, okay? don't jump in at that point because we're, we're diverting, but thanks for your call. With respect to, you know, you think the, this program is to spy on Americans, it, it is not, at least not from what I have seen, and I've gone out to the NSA and sat with the analysts several times. The, the, the focus here of all these folks who go to work in our intelligence agencies is to keep America safe and to protect us from the next terrorist attack, to be able to find people who might want to kill us before they carry out, uh, carry out their plan. And, and that's, that's what this is all about for them. I also believe, though, that the best way to check against future excesses, somebody who might, uh, who might stray, is, is checks and balances among the three branches of government. And, and I think that's yet another reason we need to fix and update the foreign intelligence surveillance law so that for the long term, those checks and balances are in place and that tension stays there. Washington, D.C., go ahead, Republican line. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. And uh, Republican, uh, uh, pardon me, Congressman Wilson, thank you very much for appearing this morning. Sure. A, a big concern with a lot of the Americans is, of course, habeas corpus, and they feel that maybe they've lost some of their rights with this spying program and the surveillance program. And I, I just wonder if you could address when people have been picked up, either American citizens or, uh, I guess, illegals, if, if the habeas corpus rights and they're detaining, being detained, possibly Guantanamo, what's your, what's your thoughts were on habeas corpus? Uh, as opposed to their rights, uh, you know, I know the the habeas corpus law when it was created probably didn't cover the phone system as much. And also, I was wondering what your views were uh, if Ron Paul wins the GOP nomination, if you're willing to support him and uh, maybe uphold the habeas corpus, which you swore allegiance to when you uh, became an Air Force officer, if that's correct. Yeah, the habeas corpus law does not apply to uh, to uh, wiretapping. Habeas corpus has to do with being charged. As I'm not a lawyer, I don't serve on the Judiciary Committee, um, but it doesn't. the The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act has to do with having warrants to listen uh, to foreign intelligence, to listen to to conversations, the content of conversations on uh, through electronic surveillance. So, so it's quite separate from habeas corpus law. Knoxville, Tennessee. Go ahead, please. It, okay. Um, my problem is I don't really mind people listening to my phone calls. The oversight failed when the Republicans control Congress. This administration has run roughshod over all of us. That's what I'm worried about. Maybe the next administration uh, won't, but they have just uh, trashed our Constitution, and the, the Congress has not stood up to them. Well, I was the one who called for... The, the, uh, the, the, the administration did not brief all of the intelligence committees when I believe they should have. They brief, briefed what are called the Gang of Eight, eight Democrats and Republicans. So it was a, four Republicans, four Democrats, and who were briefed on this program for, for a period of three, three, three and a half years, I guess. Um, and then when it was publicly revealed, I was the one as a Republican chair of the committee that oversees the National Security Agency that demanded to be briefed. And when I got stiff-armed uh, after uh, over the, the Christmas period in 2005, uh, I, I wrote to the president and then finally publicly demanded to be briefed. And that's when it broke and we, uh, 
uh, they, we were, began to be briefed. We held multiple hearings. We went out to the National Security Agency. We talked to experts inside and outside government. And I was the one that introduced the legislation to update the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Good oversight is actually hard work. It, it means going through a lot of documents, spending a lot of time. It's not the kind of cheap shot um, stuff that, that, that people, you know, theater that happens in big committee rooms as far as I'm concerned. It, it's really very hard work. And in this case, it was done in, in classified session, uh, largely in the, in the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. And yes, we did do that work, and it led to, the, to draft legislation that I think needs to be passed through the Congress. Well, thanks for being here on FISA Update. Uh, as we close, I want to just go back to some details around the David Iglesias call. Uh, but we mentioned uh, th that there is a preliminary investigation by the House uh, Ethics Committee on that. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Uh, can, you f can you tell me what the process is? Anybody looking into it? Not that I know of. Because I read that in news reports, so that's incorrect. That's incorrect. So as far as you're concerned, the situation is settled, done? Uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, my call to him was entirely appropriate. And that's my responsibility. If somebody makes an allegation like that against a sitting U.S. attorney, I can't look the other way. Okay. Well, thank you for your time this morning. Appreciate you being here and taking calls. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break, and uh, when we come back, you'll meet another one of the student winners in, in C-SPAN's 2007 Student Cam Video Contest. <laughs>